going back to the home screen. But as you can see, um, the menu system uh, has a nice uh, introduction animation where it slides in off of the side of the screen. Uh, yeah. It makes it obvious which thing is currently selected. Um, I'm using the arrow keys now, so the keyboard I can navigate and the Z or Z key to I can make a selection or I can touch with the touch screen. Mouse obviously works too and I can pick up my controller so the control pad works as well. Mm -hmm. And this is all with Spriter. Um, so in a minute I'm going to show you how that how I make all that work. So let me show you. So you can see all of this mess of sprites up here um, yeah. and text. And those are the sprites that got automatically generated when I imported the spriter file and I added a layer. Uh, let's see, I think it's on the stuff layer maybe. Um, there's a spriter object that I centered on screen right here called menu. Um, and I'm going to show you that actual spriter file now. So here we are in spriter. And as you can see, in order for me to set this up, what I originally did, making sure we're still recording, <laughs> um, what I originally did was um, give myself a background image that represents the size of an actual entire screen. Okay. And I centered it to zero, zero. And then so I used that as a guide so it was there behind every animation. Um, so I'm just putting it back so that you can see how it works. I'm going to fix its Z order. Hold on. Edit. Copy. Where's copy Z order? Uh, copy Z order. There we go. All right. So that's how I knew when it when in things are safely off screen and exactly how far to bring them in so that they'll be on screen but then once i was done with all of the animations then i uh -huh. just went in selected it and held shift and press delete and that deletes it from all the frames okay all right so anyway. cool so as you can see i created um buttons which are a combination of a um, text sprite and a um, and a background, so we have this, and then we have an image with the text, and then like I could use that image or an action point as a placeholder, and then attach a uh, an actual text object or a, what's called a sprite font to each one. Okay, but that would require a lot more sort of noodling around by the uh, artist or designer to make sure that once it's running in the actual game engine that the actual text object that the code the game code is putting in place of those action points is yeah. in the perfect place and is centered in that the font itself is the right size so I wanted okay. to eliminate all the guesswork and this way also uh, people could visually animate. So for example, if I wanted, I could make it so that the text is invisible. For example, we could bring down its opacity. Right, so, hmm. and then um, we'll do that here too. All right, I gotta do it here as well. So now it starts invisible slides on and then it fades like once it lands it fades in oh, yeah, I see that. So, so yeah that's stuff that would be a lot harder to do and like i could even do stuff like um make it start out squished as well oops why is it doing that uh, it looks like a bug anyway the idea would be like i don't know why it's scaling it's almost like it thinks maybe my keyboard's screwing up it's like it thinks shift is held down or something. It doesn't matter uh, in this case. Um, so as you can see, like now the text is fading in and zooming out. So oh, yeah. you have all kinds of fancy stuff very easily to customize your menu animations. And so the person that gets this platformer engine is also going to get this actual Spriter file so that they can go into Spriter 
um, and completely customize the actual like movements and fades, but they could also um, uh, they could also change the actual artwork um, very quickly. Like obviously, this is just one image, so you mm -hmm. could, and you could completely change the look. And another thing that you could do is if you wanted wanted to add multi language support, you would just have other language versions of these little text images and then you would mm -hmm. set up a character map that would be you know you'd have one called english one called you know french or russian or whatever and sure. then um and then by setting that character map it would be swapping out all of these english ones with the other one and then in the game you would just say you know you'd have a menu button somewhere with maybe a flag to toggle which uh, language you want and um and then just say, you know, if the French flag is touched or clicked, then change, you know, set the character map to French, and then you'd have uh, the whole menu system would then just automatically update to whatever language. So, oh, neat. so, and all right, so once it plays, here's where it gets really kind of cool and sprighter. So you could see we have. Um, some animations are carefully set to be a looping animation and uh -huh. some are not set to looping which means they're gonna they're gonna trigger that they're finished once they stop playing uh, in the game engine so what I did is I created in Spriter, in Spriter Pro I should say you can set metadata so if, if you look down here I can expand metadata and you can see I added a ton of different bits of metadata to this uh, this entity. So you can see yeah. here it's called main menu. That's the entity. So if I add any variable to the metadata in any animation, that variable is now available to me for all of the animations within that entity. And then I can set like anywhere in any keyframe, I can change the value of those variables. And they can be text strings, they can be uh, integers, or they can be float. What is it? Floats? Like, uh, yeah. what's the other word for that? Um, you know, a number with a decimal point. Yeah, des point. decimal points. Or yeah, uh, there's another word for it, but I can't think of it right now. But anyway, so um, and let me just show you how you would do that. Like, you can go anywhere in the timeline, or I press the one key to get back to the first keyframe. Um, if I double click anywhere in this metadata area, uh, as you can see, this shows me the current time. So if I need to be really accurate, I can type something in. So okay. for example, if I want to add something to this exact timeline where something happens at 400, then I can double click in here and even be sloppy about it. But then I can type 400 yeah. and get to that exact location. And then now I can say, all right, for example, this is how you create a new one. Let's say I want a variable that sends text data through to the game engine. Then we'll call this, for example, um, uh, well, yeah, uh, let's just say text variable. Then I'll click create new. So it's got the name text variable in there. And then I change its type from a float, oh yeah, decimal number, um, to integer or string. In this case, we want it to be a string. And then we can put a default value. So we'll call this, uh, um, uh, let's see, we'll be dick, dick. There we go. Uh, create variable. So now we've got, and then we, there's a little checkbox here. Now that we've created this, it's available for the entire entity. But now we're going to click this little checkbox that says, OK, it has a keyframe here. It exists in this exact moment in time. And uh -huh. now we can double click in current value and we can change that. Um, so for example, you could have, well, I'll show you this is where this comes in really handy. As you can see, one of the actual ones I created was called next anim, yeah. right? So if I go to uh, the beginning of the timeline, double click, go to the beginning here. Uh, oops. There we go. You'll see at zero in the timeline, next animation is active and its current value is intro to one, right? Oh, okay. So as you can see right here, 
in my list of animations, I have an animation called Intro to One. Yeah. So while this is playing, its variable called Next Animation is called Intro to One. And in the game engine, I have an event that says, whenever any animation is playing, if the variable from the Spider object called Intro uh, called Next Anim has a value in it, has a string in it, they mm -hmm. then automatically play the animation that is named whatever that string is in that variable. So oh, cool. just by doing that one event in uh, in Construct2, um, I can now, in Spriter, just edit that metadata and carefully control how my uh, menu system behaves so that you'll see, like, you know, any animation, like intro, it's automatically going to trigger the playing of whatever it's intro introing into. Mm. And then, so here we have intro to one. So this is transitioning from the original intro to the actual first frame of the idle animation for when you have the first menu item selected, right? So, and of course, if we look here, intro to one, in its metadata for next anim, it is set to one, right? Which is a text string, even though it looks like a number, uh, because yeah. that is the name of the next animation. And you'll see a difference now when I go from this animation to this animation. Do you see these boxes? Yeah. So in Spriter Pro, you can change what you're creating with the Alt key held down. And the important one is create box here. And these, so I'm holding the Alt key and I'm clicking and dragging. I've just created a collision rectangle that can be used in a game engine to detect mm -hmm. collisions and touches or clicks. So okay. I've created uh, touch boxes that are going to handle the collision detection or clicking or touching on touch screens um, for each thing. So these are now, these boxes are now um, each a separate box for each touch. And then the really cool thing is, as I showed you, you can have metadata for the entire entity. The really cool thing is in Spider Pro, you can also have metadata for any particular sub thing in your animation. So oh, for example, here we have box 000, which I could have named, but didn't bother. Um, so box 000, uh, if, if I click on it, you'll see I've got this orange line here that gives me, it shows me where it is in the um, sort of hierarchy. And um, so I can go to its specific, and you can see it has a metadata tab if I expand. Yeah. So if I click its metadata tab, I can add things. So I added a variable uh, for strings called touch anim. And of course, okay. what that does, it's active here and one pressed. So what that means is uh, if it's touched, then it's going to trigger playing this animation, which is one pressed. And then so here, same thing. We've got this other box in its metadata. Its touch animation is going to be two pressed. OK, right? I see. So and then back in Construct2, I have an event that says if any of these boxes are touched, which also means clicked on. Uh, so if it's touched or clicked on, then immediately trigger playing the animation from its metadata in its touch animation variable. Uh, so let me actually show you. Um, uh, so here we are. Um, oh yeah, and this is going to be important. Um, so touch, so that means is an object touched? So on touched an object, and then I created a family since there were multiple boxes. I took all of the, I rounded up all of the, um, what Spriter does, I, I mean what Construct2 does, or I should say the Spriter plugin in Construct2, when you import a Spriter animation, any box you created gets converted or created into a standard Construct2 box, uh, Sprite. Um, so that it interacts perfectly with all of the standard uh, collision detection that Construct2 uses, so it can collide with other, you know, native Construct2 sprites and things like that. So sure. 
what I did was, let's see, where is, uh, so I created a family called, it's just going to be something like touch boxes or something. Touch, uh, no, that's torch, hold on. Uh, menu touch boxes. All right, so if I double click on that, oh no, I have to right click and choose edit. So you'll see, uh, if you create a family and choose edit, you'll get this little dialog where you can hunt down all of the different objects and you can add them to the family. Okay. So once it was imported, I carefully found every touch rectangle from the menu spider object and yeah. I added it to this one family. So what that's letting me do is, like no matter how many additional ones I add into the spider, so let's say I want to add an entire other um, option, right? So, I mean, I'm not going to go through all the work right now, but you'll see what I mean. So, um, so here I just, what I did was I selected this bone and then I press the Z key and that's going to keep that bone selected, but also select everything that's a child of that bone. All right. And then I just held control down and left clicked and dragged the bone. And now it created a clone of the bone and all of the children. Oh, I see. Um, and all at once. So that's a really convenient way to add an entire other thing. But then I would need to do the same thing. Uh, select it, press control Z and then control C to copy and then control shift V to add it to all frames. So now I've got an entire other, um, other uh, menu option, but cool. then obviously I also need to create its own box. So I could do the same thing. I can select this box, hold control, left click and drag. I can move that to the bottom of the Z order if I want to, so I can see the button. And then now this, I can set its metadata as well to trigger other animations. So as you can see, like you can add and delete entire menu options to customize your game's features. And as yeah. so long as you set the metadata properly, um, you know, those variables, it's it's just going to work. When you import it back into Construct 2, you don't have to add any more code for your menu option to work. Like, obviously, once the menu tells it what to do, like if, you're, if you add a menu option to control your game volume or something, like to mute it, mm -hmm. then, of course, you would need to add some event in there that says you know, set the, um, that once an animation is finished playing, like volume touched or whatever, then set the, the actual game's uh, audio volume to, you know, the variable called volume that was set in Spriter. But that's yeah. all you would have to do. So anyway, the point okay. is it makes it super easy to, uh, to make very nice, very, you know, interactive animated uh, menu mm -hmm. systems uh, with Spriter. So, wow, yeah, so really cool. But the other tricky thing that you have to do, and specifically in Construct 2, so that the, um, the sprite that you've just touched, it needs to sort of, you need to remind Construct 2, in a sense, that, oh, we're talking about this particular instance. Like, in this family of menu touches, we're talking about this specific sprite, which happens to be like we're tying it back together so it's like okay one of these sprites was touched but now we have to say yes but we need to relate it to which menu uh object uh spriter object is this a part of so that we can retrieve the metadata from the spriter object so that's oh, okay. what this event called find spriter object for so because we use this family here um uh so we have untouched. So this, as far as Construct2 right here is concerned, this is dealing purely with normal Construct2 sprites. So, yeah. so after we detect that, that, um, that touch, now we need to say, OK, hey, Construct2, we want, we're dealing with that sprite, but we want to deal with that sprite as it pertains to the spriter object that it's a part of. So that's what sure. find spriter object for, and then you can see it's the same thing. Menu touch boxes. So that's the okay. really if you ha if you leave this out, none of it will work. Ah. It won't be able to retrieve the metadata from the spriter thing 
because right. you didn't tell it to sort of correlate like hey which sprite was this and how does it pertain to the sprite or animation so that's that's, that's what that's doing so the way you would add that you would do add action and then you would do you would go to the sprite or object which i think is called what is it called menu yep so you would click on this and then you would choose there should be something in here called find uh, let's see um, I don't remember where it is. Let me see. Hmm. I'm not seeing it currently. I really should be wearing my glasses too. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Objects, find Sprite or object from C2 object. Cool. Right, so you just click that, and then you do, well, mm -hmm. which one? So because it was the family menu touch, I could just do menu touch. Oops. Menu. Menu touch. And that's how you add that. And then, so I'm deleting that redundant one. And then I set. Right set the animation of the spider object so you'll see the menu spider object set its animation to the variable uh, touch anima so uh, that's another really important one let me quickly show everyone how I do that so I do add action I go back to the menu oops, uh, menu spider object I do set animation and then Instead of a text string, where obviously I could type a specific one like intro, in this case we need to retrieve metadata from Spryder. So again, I go to menu here, and then we'll click on that, and I've got all these options, and I look for variable uh, or value. So it's tags and variables. I go into value, and then you can see, so we have the Spryder object menu va uh, value, and then here, is where I would um, click, it was called, I think, touch anim. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's retrieving that particular value from the metadata from that particular thing. Um, okay. Oh, wait, no, uh, I, I need to uh, clarify again. Like, you, could, you can read it here. It says returns the current value of the spider. This would be from the main metadata of the entire entity. So you can oh. see I need the object's name and then the name of the oh, variable. Right. Uh, so variable name first, it says right here, and then object name. So here's the variable name, but then I would need a comma, and then I would need the object name, and then um, uh, that would be the, uh, let's see, found object. Okay, so, uh, so then we would go back again, we would go into menu, there we go, menu, and then somewhere in here there is going to be found object. Objects, found object. So I double click on that. So whatever it found was the object that it was touched based on Spryder. That's going to be its yeah. name there. That's the name of its metadata value called touch anim. Play from start, that's all good. So that's how I created that event. So is um, the found object variable automatically loaded from the find spreader action you have at the top? Yes, that once you do find object, um, the spreader plugin is automatically now keeping for this one event. It's going, oh, okay, this is the object's name, this is its position, any okay. other relevant data, it now has handy. So like we could set like it, like if we went in Spryder and for some bizarre reason we set this collision rectangle's angle to something weird yeah then I could um, uh, then I could set even like the angle of something else to match that angle okay but um, yeah so anyway that's how that works and then cool. one cool thing I should mention is let me get rid of that extra box I created. Not that it really matters, but anyway, so I don't plan on saving this. Um, 
So another cool thing is uh, what are called triggers. Mm -hmm. So oh, and I, I I showed this for the boss how in the in the intro animation of the boss there's a very specific keyframe where the boss lands, and then I use yeah. the trigger in Spider to trigger a screen shake. Right. So yeah, that's called a that's called a trigger, um, or an event trigger. Uh, but you already know how to do that, and I think I used that for some aspect of the menu system, but I can't remember uh, why specifically. But yeah, you get the idea. If you wanted to trigger, like let's say, let's say you were being really playful, and you create your menu system, but then you also have like your characters playing in the background. If you remember for like in Super Mario 3 on the um, on the N Nintendo Entertainment System, like the intro screen it says the title, but uh, down below it's got the characters running yeah. around and they're like bouncing off of turtle shells and stuff. Right, yeah. If you want, you could have those as like regular sprites or whatever in Construct 2 doing their thing, but then you could have it so that when the user is picking specific menu options at specific times, you could do anything. You could trigger, you can trigger, oh, you know, be, like uh, trigger a firework going off in the background or trigger, oh, cool. you know, whatever, a character sneezing or jumping or whatever. Um, right. so you could do really cool, playful things with, with triggers. And to do that, you would just go in here. Uh, yeah, you right click in anywhere in this hierarchy here and up at the top it says append event trigger at time okay and so you can see wherever I am in the timeline that's where this red is so we could do firework or you know obviously screen shake or whatever and then now yeah. you can see we have an event trigger called firework and now we have an, an we can expand that and now we have metadata available for that trigger so we could set like which firework or what color is it going to be or whatever are yeah. other values that we could set within the event trigger. Awesome. Um, that's yeah. That's how uh, that's how you can do entire menu systems in Spryder. Uh, that's pretty powerful stuff. Yep. And then so you could even do like sub menus just by sort of visually creating it. Oh, uh, <laughs> the other really important thing I did not mention is so let's go back to one of the menu. Oh, and that's the other cool thing you don't want the menu system to be able to be interacted with obviously when it's in the middle of a transition or like if it's playing the animation like you just selected an option you don't want them to be able to to go oh no no i, I actually want to go up now to another menu option right like you've selected right. that's it like until it's done with whatever it needs to do so you'll see that those metadata very uh, values don't uh none of them are ever active except of course for next anim but the thing I was going to mention is, so here we have an actual interact, um, an animation that can be interacted with, so only those have the touch boxes, and only those have metadata for other things. So let's look up over here. We've got an up and a down, so this is really cool. So these variables tell it what animation to play if the player presses up or down. Right, so I've got it tied in in Construct 2 so that if the player presses up or down on the keyboard or the control pad and it's in this particular animation because these variables are active, it's yeah. going to automatically, if I press up, it's going to, uh, in this case, play the animation called 1 to 3. So it's going to transition. And that's because 1 is selected. So if you press yeah. up, it's going to loop to the bottom, which is one, two, three. Oh. So, uh, and you can see if yeah. I look at the animation called one to three, what it does is it goes all the way down, oh, cool. right? And then it illuminates yeah. that one. And then you can see it's going to say in metadata, next anim is three. So once it's done playing this animation that cannot be interacted with, there's no touch boxes. There's no, you know, none of those variables are set. Like you, the user can't do anything. And right. It's done playing this, and it switches to animation three. At which point, it's got all its touch boxes. So you can never accidentally. You don't need to make any careful programming that says in construct two. You don't have to say, well, don't let them touch any of these boxes if 
you know, if it's in the middle of a transition or if it's playing the animation like you just touched a box, like those boxes yeah. just don't exist anymore, so you don't have to worry about it. And the variables um, for what to do if you press up or down or, or the select key, uh, because those variables are inactive, it will be completely unresponsive to any input from the user. Interesting. So, anyway, really, cool. really a uh, useful way to be able to create very like you could do you know you could go crazy you could like yeah and, uh, all kinds of uh, cool um, you know like these animations look pretty static in this simple example it just has sort of the bouncing um, arrow here uh, yeah. but you know this whole thing you could make this whole thing pulse very easily all I would need to do is like select this and um, I'm holding shift and dragging this bottom corner, so now the whole box is bigger um, yeah. at this keyframe. So then, oh, I forgot to get it scale, so I'm going to go here and set it scale to 1-1. One, one. So now the size of this is going to be sort of throbbing along with the movement of the arrow. So as you can see, That's super cool. easy to edit things. You could use yeah. You could use image swapping, like I could make it so that it, does a really obnoxious because um, that's what we want. We want to annoy the the player, um, <laughs> so we can make it Sounds right. flash back and forward uh, from dark to light by doing an image swap. So you can see now, like it's got this annoying blank thing going on. <laughs> does it have your attention yet? Can you yes, tell which one is selected? Yes. So as you can see, and then, hey, why are not? you sure that that's the one I selected? Yeah, maybe? exactly. So hey, we um, it's not. It's not screaming for your attention enough yet, so let's make, no, let's no, make the. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, you can go nuts very easily. <laughs> I see that. Awesome. So yeah, so it just really gives you an insane amount of control, and the really cool thing, like I said, you could add entire menu options uh, very, very easily. Like imagine if I wanted to add, like, and remember, um, you can always add back in this. Um, Screen. I shouldn't have done it there. I should have gone to a keyframe. I just added a unnecessary keyframe. But let me go back to keyframe zero. Um, drag that on. Make sure it's at zero zero. Put it to the back. And now, like, let's say we wanted to. Let's say this yes was a flag, right? Mm -hmm. So I could put that up there. Make sure it's in all keyframes. Um, and now I could just add metadata to that with the names of the character maps for like English, French, Russian, whatever. And then I would just go into character maps and create new character map, call it French in this example. And then you're going to tell it, you're going to select from here and you're going to say, okay, yes, it's going to be we, oui. or if you want mm -hmm. to be really casual, we oui, bien sûr, which is yes, of course. Um, so you could, um, uh, yeah, you would just set up, like, I don't have a Wii uh, graphic image, but we'll change yes to no, right. because you know how rude and contrary yes. those French people supposedly are, so. Yeah, we'll clearly. That. So, um, so now you'll see if I activate that character map to take a look at it. Oops, it's not working out. I must, that must be a different yes graphic. Uh, hold on a second. Well, you get the, yeah, you can see there's, uh, where is it? Yeah, I've got too many stuff. I don't want to fish around. But you get the mm -hmm. idea that um, you, you okay. can set, yeah, let me see what's. Oh, no, I didn't set it, actually. Uh, it says ignored. Oh, it's right click, that's why. So yes will become no. All right. Okay. So now, there we go. See, oh, neat. so this is a way to test, and you can stack. Um, you can stack. Um, uh, you can have multiple character maps and have them active at all at the same time if you wanted to. Obviously, that wouldn't work with language because you're just switching all text things to their equivalent. But right. um, you know, you could have a Christmas theme where your text looks different, and there's like a, a Santa Claus hat on some letters. You know, anything sure. you want to do. So that, you know, you could, anyway, that's the idea. Like so 
Yeah, so then all I would need to do is add um, uh, a metadata value called French to this, right? And mm -hmm. then I would add an event in Construct2 that says, oh, and I, I would add a collision box, I forgot. I would add a collision box and I would do the metadata for the collision box. So in here, I'll click and drag. Now I have this box and we could even call this box French as well. And then we could give that its metadata like so. Just double click in here. Make sure we're at zero. And then do touch uh, char map, for example. Create new, set it to a string. Default value will be French. Create variable and make it active. And now if I save that out and re-imported it into Construct2, I could make an event in Construct2 that says if that particular box is pressed, um, then set the character map of the Spriter object to whatever the variable is in that value we created for that touch box. So just yeah. like that, we would have, we would add language, which I'll probably do, at least That's to the cool. deluxe version of, of, the, uh, of this uh, engine. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's how that all works. That's really neat. Um, yeah. So that's that's how you do an advanced menu system in Construct Two. Um, very cool. So.